Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Mary Rice. I'm part of the Bloomington Human Rights Commission. It's great to see so many people here from uh, uh, staff, commissioners, and council members uh, to hear Tom Glaspie speak. Uh, Tom Glaspie spoke to the Human Rights Commission a few months ago, and what he said was so timely and so critical to the work that we do and so very well presented that we thought he has to be heard by a wider audience. So here he is today. Um, Tom Glaspie served as the Minnesota State Demographer since 1979. Uh, the demographer is with the Minnesota Department of Administration. Before moving to Minnesota, he held the position of demographer at the Andrus Ger uh, Gerontology Center at the University of Southern California. He received his PhD in economics from Pennsylvania State University, specializing in economic demography, and he also holds a master's degree in agricultural economics. So, Tom? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is really a great turnout. Thank you very much for a poor little demographer. Um, for some, I know some of you have seen demographers before, but for their, those of you who have never seen one in the wild, uh, just a brief definition, it said that we're a lot like accountants, only not quite as exciting. <laughs> now that I've lowered your expectations, uh, what I want to do is to talk about some really big changes that we are seeing in, in our society and in, really in the world. And one of the things that I hope to, to, for you to walk away with is that some of the balls that are up in the air right now, some of the things in the world that you, you just seem to make no sense at all, that maybe some of these will make a little bit more sense when, when we are through, because there are really large-scale things that are, that are happening. There are some trends that have been going on for a long time and, and we've grown accustomed to them and, and we know to expect them. And then there are other things that are happening right now that have literally never happened in the history of human societies, in the history of human civilization. So there are unique things and in many ways this decade will be a unique decade in the future history of Bloomington, of Minnesota, of the United States, of the world. And so we are undergoing some of these tremendous large-scale changes and in many ways they are all related. There are strong relations and I'm going to try, hopefully try to build some of those, uh, some of those relationships. First I just want to talk a little bit about growth in Minnesota and, and also in Bloomington and how Minnesota and Bloomington are changing. Uh, first is that Minnesota is a growing place. Um, I know some people are shocked to hear that. Minnesota is actually growing. Uh, Minnesota added about 380,000 people last decade. Uh, that's about a 7.8% growth rate over the decade. That's a bit slower than the nation. The nation was slightly under 10% for, uh, for the decade. We actually, during the 90s, grew faster than the nation but this past decade, we grew a little bit more slowly. Uh, now, you have probably heard and are probably convinced that every business and every person in Minnesota moved to South Dakota during the decade. Uh, actually, Minnesota and South Dakota, once again, tied uh, for the fastest population growth of any Frost Belt state. That's any state in the Midwest or Northeast half of the United States that Minnesota and, North, and South Dakota, not North Dakota, but South Dakota and Minnesota have led all of those states in population growth rate every decade since World War II. And we continued to lead and Minnesota and South Dakota again tied for population growth rate, but of course we added a lot more people and because Minnesota as well is a much bigger 
is a much bigger state. The other thing I want to point out, you know, other than the fact that most of the growth in the United States continues to be in the Southwest, everybody knows that, you know, so it's not a big surprise. But the other thing that's important to understand is, is that is that Minnesota and the United States are changing. We are changing racially and ethnically, culturally, and across almost every dimension of diversity. In fact, even the concept of diversity has become a more diverse concept, that, that we keep adding dimensions to the concept of diversity. But in terms of a narrow concept of merely race and ethnicity as defined by the federal government. And here I have to back up and say, just what am I talking about? The federal government defines each decade what we mean by race and ethnicity. Race and ethnicity, basically ethnicity means are you Hispanic or not? Uh, race and ethnicity in the United States is not a biological concept. It is not a genetic concept concept. It is not a cultural concept. It is a political legal concept, purely. No other, no other country of the world shares the definition that the United States has. And not only do we have a different definition of what we are talking about, but it changes over time. Almost every decade has seen a change in the concept of what we mean by race and ethnicity. This is not a fixed concept. And, and the people who make this decision in their infinite wisdom is the President's Office of Management and Budget, as they have done so for several decades. They sit down and figure, well, how have we changed? and what are some of the important things that we need to do and need to understand, and that's, and that's how we come up with new definitions of race and ethnicity. This last decade, in 2010, the definition didn't change much, but it did change a lot in 2000. The change didn't seem like very much at the time, but what was added was instead of being able to check only one box, you can now check as many as applied. And we went from thinking that we had a pretty good clue of what's going on in the world to believing in, we, we really don't understand, you know, that the world is far, far more complex than we had ever, than we had ever imagined. That all aside, that narrow concept of race and ethnicity as defined by the federal government that changes over time, using that, that concept, most of the population growth in Minnesota, about two-thirds, and most of the population in the United States, about two-thirds, was of people of minority race or ethnicity. Basically, that's a short way of saying anybody who is not white, not Hispanic. And so most of our population growth continues to be in populations of color. Minnesota is, as it turns out, is one of the least diverse states in terms of this narrow definition of race and ethnicity, one of the least diverse states in the country. Our most diverse county is Ramsey County, where St. Paul lives, and Ramsey County is less diverse than the national average. We aren't a very diverse state. We are a non-diverse state in the least diverse corner of the United States. We are a bit more diverse than North Dakota and Iowa, about the same as Wisconsin and South Dakota. That's not very diverse. That's, you know, this is not a very diverse area. But we're changing, and we will continue to change over, uh, as, well, as far out as we can see. We will continue to be more diverse, but during our lifetimes, we will never catch the nation up because the nation is also changing. Interestingly enough, even though Minnesota grew more slowly than the nation overall, almost all of our racial and ethnic subgroups, except for American Indian, grew more rapidly than the national average, and that includes the white, not Hispanic population, grew more rapidly than the United States. And the reason why we could have each one of our subgroups grow more rapidly than the nation, but still grow slower 
as an overall population is that we are less diverse. So Minnesota continues to exhibit fairly strong growth, uh, growth factors. Uh, we saw particularly strong growth in the Hispanic or Latino population and, uh, and in the black or uh, uh, African American population. The Asian population saw strong growth and that multiple race group experienced very strong growth in both Minnesota and the nation, but stronger growth in Minnesota. And now I can't compare with what happened in the 80s or the 90s with that population because that population didn't exist because it wasn't part of the federal government's definition of race and ethnicity. So some things we can't track back in time because, well, that's not the way we collected the data and, uh, and so, but we are continuing to change and the way we define things continues to change. Looking a little bit at, at Bloomington's history, uh, going back in history, uh, oh gee, that's a sort of a light colored line, my apologies. Bloomington was, was a fairly small, very slow growing place up until about 1950 and then after World War II, began to experience very strong population growth and for two decades just mushroomed going from going from about 10,000 people to 80,000 people it's an eightfold increase in two decades that's a lot of growth that is a lot of growth fantastic growth and then Bloomington leveled off in population and has remained at a fairly level since. Now, what happened after World War II is that people all over the United States expressed a very different kind of, of preference in terms of where they want to live. When people, when men return, mostly men, return from World War II and, and, and the, the, the war was over and the Great Depression was over and, you know, people suddenly felt wow, you know, the world has changed. So what we're going to do is we're going to go out and buy houses that are further out, bigger houses on bigger lots and have lots of kids, lots of babies. And they did. They did. And so we began to see this outward movement of people from the core cities all over the country. And we began to see population decline in the core cities. Even those cities that you think have really grown a lot, like Houston, Texas, actually the core city declined in population. Minneapolis right now is at about its 1920 population. St. Paul is at about its 1945 population. And what happened was people left Minneapolis and St. Paul for those way, way out <laughs> distant suburbs like Richfield, Robbinsdale, Golden Valley, Bloomington, you know, okay. Way, way, way out there. Okay. And then they filled up. And the people that they filled up with were buying homes that were about the same price and same general price range. They were about the same size. The families that moved in there had, uh, they were about the same age, had about the same number of kids, about the same kind of income. <laughs> Yeah, it was a fairly homogeneous population. And they all moved in at once. And so there was this tremendous explosion of growth. And all the roads were brand new. And, and all the sewer lines were brand new. And, and the schools were, you know, the schools really weren't connected to the city. So the schools were immediately overwhelmed. They had all these kids starting kindergarten and first grade, and the schools didn't know what to do. So almost immediately in the 50s, we started build, 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 build schools everywhere. We just built them as fast as we could, and by the time we got them all built, the kids had grown up and moved on to junior high school. And so we build, 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 build junior high schools, and by the time we got those built, well, they moved on to high school. And so we build, build, build high schools, and by the time we get them all built, the kids had moved on to their own career or to college or their own life or something like that. And those initial suburban areas 
that had grown so rapidly and then capped off, many of them began to experience some decline. Some decline. Bloomington was a little bit different because there was a lot of multifamily units that were oriented towards younger, younger people at the time, and that helped maintain the population. But places like Richfield, Robbinsdale, uh, Roseville, uh, uh, Fridley, Brooklyn Park, uh, you know, I mean, you name it, all these in New Hope, all the interior suburbs went through this rapid growth and then a little bit of leveling off and then began to decline. And incidentally, about the time that they began to decline was when the roads needed to be redone and the sewers needed to be repaired. And, and suddenly the cost of running government started rising. Cost for running government had been real cheap up to that point and it began to rise. And the people that had been moving, young people, instead of moving into places like Bloomington and, and Richfield and Robbinsdale and places like that, instead of moving back into these places, young people came along and started moving further and further and further out. And we saw this, this outward expansion of metropolitan areas. Many people refer to that as urban sprawl. And, and there was this sprawling effect and metropolitan areas got bigger and bigger and bigger. And because of the, this, this new wave of suburbs was being built, and that's the uh, Eden Prairie and Egan and, you know, Shakopee and, you know, you go on out. Uh, further and further out, and it's the same story. The people that move there are all about the same age, have about the same number of kids, about the same income, buying similar kinds of houses. The kids all start school at the same time. You've got to build new schools. There are older schools in some of the interior places that have excess capacity, but now we've got to build new schools because that's where people are. And they can claim that the new places can claim that, you know, we can operate government much more efficiently and much cheaper than you can in the older suburbs and central cities. Well, for right now they can because their roads and everything were built by somebody else and wait till they have to start getting repaired. And, and that's when the price of government begins to, begins to equalize. Bloomington has gone through this, this life cycle process, although some of that decline has been abated by the nature of, uh, by the, nature of, of the city itself and by the fact that there's been a lot of, a lot of multifamily housing. However, there have been large scale changes uh, we continue to see growth in uh, particularly an older population in Bloomington and Bloomington is getting older and older and older with fewer children but notice that 40 some that 30 something 40 something young people uh, kind of crowd part of that is an outflow of people of that age they're moving outward to the next tier of suburbs uh, but Part of that is also that that is a very small generation that's that generation X which is which is a very small generation. And Bloomington begins to see, over the last decade, an increasing diversity in its population, particularly with growth in the Hispanic or Latino and the black or African American population and some declines in the majority, in the majority white population. Uh, there are enormous differences in age among the groups and among these racial and ethnic subgroups and those differences will become more obvious. The majority white population has a median age of about 51, which is really pretty old. It's a very old, very old crowd. I won't point anybody out here in this room, but you know, okay, I, you know, show a hand. Everybody over, no, 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 we won't do that. Uh, but notice how the two or more races and a median age of 11, well, because to many, in many cases, those are children. Uh, uh, but the black or African American population, the median age of 22, and the Hispanic or Latino population growing very rapidly, a median age of about 23. Very young, very young populations. And in general, that is generally true. Uh, minority populations tend to be much, much, much younger, particularly in Minnesota, than, uh, than the majority white population and that there are reasons for that and 
migration and immigration is one of the main reasons. And here's the reason why there's an age selectivity. Old people don't move. <laughs> I know you think a lot of old people move to Arizona and to Florida when they retire. No, actually that number is vanishingly small. Vanishingly small. Now a lot of people spend a couple months in a warm place. But the number of people who actually move is a very, very small number of older people who move. Most of the people who move are people from about 18 to 34, and that's the vast majority of, of people who move. And families generally tend to bring their children. What a surprise. And so we also see a migration of children of, of school age. And so migration from other parts of the country is, an, is a factor, but also immigration from other parts of the world. And in Minnesota, we, uh, we've seen some interesting trends here that, uh, that I thought I'd point out. Uh, nationally, Asian and, and La Asia and Latin America are the primary sources of, of immigration to the nation. Uh, uh, those are the blue bars. Uh, Minnesota, not so much. Minnesota is much less. Where we are really exceptional is in our immigration from Africa. Minnesota is one of the few states, maybe the only state, in which m the largest single source of immigrants is Sub-Saharan Africa. We do get people from all over the world but the largest single source is Sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at this on a national basis, the largest single national source in Mexico, in, in Minnesota, is just like the nation is from Mexico. That's not a surprise because, well, they're our neighbor. You know, Mexico borders, borders the United States. Minnesota also gets folks from Canada, too. We, uh, you can see that's about 4% of our immigrants come from, come from Canada. We are certainly receiving people from countries such as Somalia, uh, but Somalia is not most of the African immigration. We receive people from all over Africa, not just from, Somalia is important. We have probably the largest Somali population in the nation. We also have the largest Liberian population in the nation. We have a growing Nigerian population, and Ghanese population, and Kenyan, and, and Ethiopian, and Eritrean. We have perhaps the largest Oromo population in the nation, but that's really hard to measure because that's a language, and it's a language that doesn't show up in the federal data because Minnesota is about the only state with a substantial Oromo population, and so it, it's not showing up separately but we receive people from all over we're receiving people from China and Vietnam and you know all over you know and and still receiving people from Europe right now the largest one of the largest most rapidly growing populations in Minnesota is people from India and we're seeing very strong growth and uh, and in the population from India, and these are trends that tend to evolve over time. They relate to primarily to two things: what's happening in the rest of the world when there's really troubled spots and terrible things are happening someplace in the world. We'll probably see some folks from there. Uh, that's sort of the source of the Liberian population and the Somali population, and more recently the Karen population from from Burma, Myanmar, of course, before those groups were the Hmong people from Southeast Asia. Uh, but we also receive people for, for job-related reasons, and, and that is the main driving force behind the, the growth of the Indian population, the population from Mexico, Latin America, and, uh, and China, and other places of, uh, of the world. I always like to show this because people have sometimes a, a strange notion of what's happening right now. And if I were to only show the, the right five bars on this, you'd say, wow, you know, boy, look at what is happening. What is happening in Minnesota? You know, I mean, we got this exploding immigrant population. But please note that the population of foreign born people 
is still substantially less than it was in 1900 or 1910. And in 1900, the population of the state was a lot smaller. And I know I've heard people say things like, yes, but they're from different places. You know, it's, it was a different situation. Uh, no, no. Read the newspapers from 100 years ago. Lord help us. The, the Norwegians came. And, you know, the Swedes. And for a while there, it was, oh gosh, the Germans were here. The worst of all were the Irish. Okay. There were all sorts of articles written about the terrible Irish. I mean, we all know that the Irish all share all sorts of characteristics, right? They're either cops or drunks. Okay. Hey, come on. You know, people are people. They're just the same. People really haven't changed. Their national origins may be different. Their languages may be different. The driving forces behind immigration are the same as they were a hundred years ago. And what that driving force is, Minnesota is still a land of opportunity. Isn't that wonderful? I think it's wonderful. Minnesota, there are people who believe that, and know, not just believe, they know, Minnesota is a land of wonderful opportunities. And they want to come here and be part of this. That's an exciting thing. And that's, that's a lot of energy coming in to, into the country. Okay. That's sort of some of the big trends that are happening in terms of, in terms of population. Uh, that leads us up to about the year 2008. And then in January of 2008, two things happened in the same month, same month, January 2008. One of those is, is that the Great Recession began. And you know, the Great Recession, that's the deepest and longest, most difficult down, economic downturn we have seen since the Great Depression. This is not a small thing. This is a really big deal. And you know, everybody knows the recession to with, right? Okay. It, it, it actually ended in July of 2009. I know you wait a minute. We're recovering from this. For a recession to end for an economist merely means that we hit bottom. It was nice to know that there was a bottom. There was a period where we weren't sure that there was a bottom. That was sort of a scary time. But by July of 2009, we knew there was a bottom. We hit that bottom, big thud, but it's a really deep hole and it's going to take a long time to dig our way out of this. The consensus forecast is, uh, is and has been for some time is that we will not fully recover our end of 2007 level of jobs nationally until, until about the end of 2013 or 2014. Okay. It's a very long and difficult, slow, laborious recovery. And in the short run, Economic, huge economic events like this affect some demographic trends. One of the demographic trends that was affected was that people had fewer babies. It, it, it's not that they're going to have fewer for their whole life. It's just that they're putting them off. You know, what is the number one most expensive thing that you can consume or buy in your lifetime? It's a child. It's a kid. Okay? I know people feel uncomfortable about Economists talking about consuming babies, but okay. That's a real, I mean, it's really expensive to have a kid. And so during recessions, when you're unsure about your job and, and you're unsure about whether or not you'll be able to keep your house and things like that, you put off having a child for, for a while. Every hospital in the state wants to know, I know they've been calling me, when this is going to turn around. Okay, because, okay, it's been going on, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, we've got four years. We're now into the fifth year of this stuff. And the number of babies is about 10 to 15 percent lower each year. And so there's all this excess capacity in the OB wards. Okay. 
And my personal opinion is, is that this is probably turning around right now. It's partially turning around because people are seeing, well, things seem to be stabilizing a little bit better. Minnesota is actually recovering earlier than the nation. Our unemployment rate is substantially below the national unemployment rate. We are in the mid 5% range now. Uh, we are substantially, substantially below. We seem to be recovering at a bit faster clip and a bit earlier than the rest of the nation. And so I think Minnesotans are about to have uh, more children. They're probably in the process of doing this right now, but there's something else that begins to click in is that after waiting four years, for some people, the biological time clock begins to go off. You know, the alarm, you hear it, it you can't shut it off, okay? It just keeps going and going and going until, well, you have a kid. So that's going to cause in the short run uh, rise in the number of babies born. There were other things, like one of the things is that people aren't moving as much anymore. And so people aren't moving out to those suburb, those exurban communities, that urban sprawl has stopped. There were all sorts of commissions of, oh, what are we going to do about urban sprawl? You know, we need to have policies about what to do about urban sprawl. We need to do something about urban sprawl. For 30 years, we've been having commissions on urban sprawl with absolutely no impact. All it takes is one little low recession and huge amounts of foreclosures and an entirely collapsed housing market and a near collapsed banking system and things like that and people's lives ruined. That's merely what it takes to, to affect this. It was a huge impact. But people simply aren't moving right now. And so people aren't moving out of Bloomington, aren't moving out of Minneapolis and St. Paul for those outer ring suburbs. And so that's favoring a little bit more growth in, uh, in the interior areas. And, and Bloomington is one of those areas I think will be benefited by that growth. Okay. Those are some of the short run impacts of, of the Great Recession that began in January of 2008. There was something else that began in January of 2008. And this is, you know, recessions come, recessions go, you get over them. Eventually, we'll forget about this one. There's only a few of us probably in this room that grew up in depression households. I mean, I grew up in a family where we talked about the depression almost every day. I mean, it was really depressing to talk about the depression every day. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, my wife would testify, I don't like to spend money at all, under any circumstances. I'm cheap, okay? But it's that depression mentality I grew up with. This recession is going to affect people for their entire, the rest of their lives. Their mentality has changed. In 2007, we believed, everybody in this room believed that housing prices could only go one way, up. <coughs> and by 2008, we were pretty sure they could go down. Now we're positive. That's not going to go away anytime soon. That's going to affect people's behavior in ways that we can't fully predict right now. It's going to affect people's behavior for the rest of our lives. So it was a big event. It was a big deal. But this other thing that I'm going to talk about is much bigger. And it's not a short run thing. It's not merely two or three generations. It's for the rest of our lives and our children's lives and our grandchildren's lives and as far out as we can see. And that is that in January of 2008, the first wave of the baby boom generation began to turn age 62 and become eligible for old age Social Security pension. Now, we have, let me ask a question. Perhaps you can help me with an answer. When did we know that the people born in 1946 <laughs> would turn 62 in 2008? Okay, you get the idea. Did we do anything to prepare for that day? And I think a lot of folks would say maybe not so much. Okay. We've not, this is not a surprise. It should not have been a surprise. It appears to have been a surprise. There were people who were literally surprised by this. Whoa, you know people age about one year every 12 months. Wow, what a remarkable concept. 
And the folks that started turning age 62 in 2008 began to turn 65 and become eligible for Medicare in January of 2011, exactly one year ago today. Okay. We have entered what demographers and economists have been referring to for at least the last four or five decades as the future age of entitlements. We've entered this period of our national history. Minnesota is not exceptional in this. We are exceptional in almost every other way. We are better educated. We are harder working. We're more likely to have a job. We're more likely to work full time. We're higher income, higher wage, lower poverty, longer lived, healthier, and better looking than the average American. <laughs> But in one way, we are exceptionally average, and that is our age structure. We are the most average state when it comes to age. We're not an old state. We're not a young state. We are that national average. So anything I say about Minnesota is also true for the United States. In this decade, this decade of the teens, we will add as many people over age 65 as we have in the last four decades combined. And next decade, we will add even more people over age 65. And in that large, that rapid growth of the 65 and older population is going to be largely over with. But don't breathe a sigh of relief right now. Because the folks that are turning 65 will be how old in 20 years? One year every 12 months, you know, one, two, three, four. 85. And at 85, your bodies begin to change and you know, it's, it doesn't matter how much you exercise and how clean of a life you have and, and how strong, you know. I mean, different people do, you know, survive better. Some people live longer. Some people, you know, are healthier, things like that. But eventually, our bodies wear out. We are organic creatures. Eventually, we do wear out, even with spare parts, okay, which increasingly... That's one of the big things right now. Shoulders, hips, knees. We got all sorts of spare parts. Keeps us going a bit longer, but eventually we do wear out. And within 20 years, we're looking for an explosion in the number of people who are over 85. And that will be a rapid growth. And the question to consider this in terms of medical care is that if we can't afford Healthcare today, what are we going to do in 20 years? We better start coming up with some solutions. We better think about how we're going to do these things going forward because this is not an unpredictable thing. Most people age about one year every 12 months. It's a pretty regular process and very predictable. Age is not the only thing that's changing. There are other things that are related to age that are also changing, one of which is the household or the family. Now, I think most Minnesotans, if I ask them, what is the most common type of family in Minnesota today? I think most people would say probably, you know, married couple with kids. That hasn't been the most common type of family in Minnesota and the United States since the early 90s. The world's changed, and it continues to change. The most common type of family in Minnesota today and the United States, Minnesota and the United States, the most common type of family is the married couples whose kids have grown up and moved away and then moved back and then moved away and then moved back. But eventually they do leave, and it's just the two of you, and it's a whole new existence. It's, you wake up one morning and say, who is this person? I haven't talked to this person in 25 years. Gee, I have to actually talk to them now because we don't have all these things to do for kids. Okay. It's a very different kind of, it's a very different kind of life. And what you view as important has suddenly changed. Schools are not the, now no longer the number one driving force in your life. You have no connection to schools. You don't have any kids in school. 
There's no connection to the school. Most school districts in Minnesota, in most school districts in Minnesota, most of the households, which are the primary taxing and voting unit, have absolutely no connection to the schools. And it's a little wonder why, when it comes to things like levy referendums, people see no relationship between my life and what these people over here are talking about, about needing more money from me to pay for. Okay. The kind of house that you're looking for. You no longer want, you know, that big old place out on the prairie, you know. All those stairs seem like a real good idea when you're 40. Not so much now that you're in your 60s. And it's going to get worse when you're in your 70s and 80s, all those stairs. All that maintenance, dusting and taking care of stuff and, and, and more, you know, the 10 acres. Boy, that seemed like a really good idea once upon a time, didn't it? Okay. People's residential preference, what they think are important in terms of how they live, changes dramatically when you become an empty nester. And over the next two decades, not only is that the most common type of family in Minnesota, that is where virtually all of the growth in families is going to occur. The number of families with children is going to be basically static. The number of married couple families with children, slight decline, Mar number of alternative types of families with children, a bit of an increase. Part of that increase is grandparents with grandchildren. And lest you think that that's, a, that that's a lovely situation, that almost never is a positive situation. That's almost never, that's always a difficult situation, um, is grandparents with, with grandchildren. They will see some growth, but married couples with kids will see a decline. The only other kind of household that's going to see any kind of substantial growth over the next two decades will be older people living alone. This has all sorts of implications about how we take care of each other, how we interact with each other. What happens when your neighbor living alone falls down and has an accident and can't get up? And they don't have one of those little things that says, I've fallen and I can't get up. Okay. They need help. They're going to have to call probably on some kind of, of publicly provided uh, uh, provider, the police, the, the emergency uh, uh, ambulance drivers, people like that, the EMTs are going to see more demand. But even the fact that we have a neighbor that is fallen and we don't know about it, we're going to need to rethink our concept of community. How do we get along with each other? How do we take care of each other? Things that used to be done within the family, there's no family around. Things that used to be assumed because we were lived in a small community where everybody knew everybody else's business, that doesn't exist anymore. Our neighbor came from another country, has, speaks a different language, looks different, but they're not different. We all need to take care of each other. We all need to be part of a community. We may have to actually work on rebuilding the concept of community. Our older citizens need to understand that the children that are in school are not an albatross around their neck. The children in school right now are their future. They are their blessing. They are all our children. It doesn't matter what language they're speaking or what they look like or what they eat. They're all our children. And so we need to figure out ways to begin to connect across age lines, generational lines. We need to connect across ethnic and racial lines, across cultural lines, across language lines in ways that we have never done before because these things aren't happening on their own. We need to actually help to encourage them to build, rebuild this concept of community because all the basis of community that we had is, is evaporating. Okay. Big changes are happening this decade. But this right now is the, for, for what is happening today, right now, 
in the early part of this, re, of this decade. This is the big one. And this is the one you hear almost nobody talking about. This is not the main topic on the, on the, the speaker circuits or the you know, campaign trails or anything like that. Uh, but this is the really big one. This is the one that has the really dramatic economic impact and it's affecting Bloomington's budget and it's affecting every aspect of your life and will increasingly affect every aspect of your life. And that is that our workforce is getting dramatically older, dramatically older. And we are standing on the verge of a huge increase in retirements. In state government in 2011, we exceeded our previous record year of 2010 retirements by nearly 50 percent. Okay. Every county, every city, every state government in the country is seeing huge numbers of retirements. School districts, the federal government is seeing huge numbers of retirements. This is not being fully factored in to the stuff that you're hearing on the news right now. We are undergoing a huge shift in the structure of our society. This, this year will spread into the private sector, into the private market sector, into our largest, more mature corporations, the ones that have a more mature workforce, will begin to see large-scale retirements. There is at least one major corporation in Minnesota where virtually every senior manager, supervisor, attorney, uh, uh, scientist, engineer, et cetera, et cetera, will retire this year in 2012. This is not a small thing. This is a really big thing. And I tell you, HR people are, you know, they don't know what to do about it. There are enormous changes happening right now. At the same time, the number of young people entering the workforce is declining. The high school graduation class reached a peak in 2008. And 2008 keeps coming back, doesn't it? Spring of 2008, we reached a peak. Our high school graduation class will fall to about the middle of the decade and then rise slowly. We will not reach our 2008 level of high school graduates until about 2023. Fewer young people available to enter the workforce, a huge portion of our people leaving the workforce and workforce is going to grow at a dramatically, dramatically slower rate so that by the end of this decade, we will be at record low levels of growth in the workforce in Minnesota and the United States. Now, as it turns out, this is our first principle of economics. This is the first day of the first class of the first semester that you took in economics, back in freshman economics. You probably missed this part. <laughs> There's only two ways to grow an economy. Only two ways to grow an economy. Having more Federal Reserve Bank notes in your wallet is nice. We all like it. Uh, I don't think anybody wants to get rid of them. We all like having more of them in our wallet and our bank accounts. That is not how you grow an economy. There's only two ways to grow an economy. One is to increase the number of people making stuff, and the other is to increase the amount of stuff each person makes. One has to do with the growth of the workforce. The other has to do with productivity. We have already dialed in, in Minnesota and the United States, that our workforce growth will be at record low levels by the end of this decade. This is the way it works. It's a simple additive. If you want 3% real growth in, the, in your economy and your labor force is growing at 1.5%, you only need 1.5% growth in your productivity. This is not bad. If your labor force has got zero growth in it, now you need 3% growth in productivity. That's a steep hill to climb. <coughs> this is not a one-shot affair. This is every year, year after year after year after year we're going to need to increase 
poor worker productivity. Is this doable? Oh, absolutely. Oh, we could do much better than that. No problem at all. Do we have the will to do that? Apparently not. Apparently not. And so most economists believe the implication of this is that economic growth is probably going to slow down. And so you get people like Mohamed El Aryan and Bill Gross who manage an organization called PIMCO, Pacific Investment Management Corporation, unless you think that they have no relationship to you, there's a good chance that they are managing at least part of your retirement fund, the fixed investment part portion. They run one of the largest bond houses in the world. And not only do they have their own product under their own name, they also manage many other the investment, the fixed investment portfolio of many other organizations, including some of the largest retirement funds. Okay. So what they say actually affects your, your pocketbook, actually affects you personally. And they've been talking for several years now and some, we're using a term that they coined called the new normal. I know the new normal is now one of the most hated terms because you hear it all the time. The new normal does not have anything to do with what kind of dishwashing soap you use. It has nothing to do with what kind of television program you watch. That's not what the new normal is about. The new normal is about an economic kind of relationship where all of those little rules of thumb that you grew up with, that you know are always true, things like housing prices will always go up, and, and for your retirement fund, you can pull out 5% a year, no problem. And, and your retirement fund, when you're saving, when you're younger, will grow at 75 to 8% a year, no problem. All those little rules of thumb cease to exist in 2008, and we have a whole new set of rules of thumb. This is not a Minnesota or a U.S. issue. This is not because somebody failed in their job, or at least not just here. This is happening all over the world. This is exactly the issue that Greece is dealing with. This is exactly the e issue that Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, France, England, all the European zone countries are dealing with. They're about a decade ahead of us in this process. Their workforce is actually declining. Their workforce is actually declining. It's getting smaller. Japan is further along in, than Europe. Japan is older than Europe. Japan's workforce began to decline in the late 90s. Japan has been in a two decade long recession with no end in sight. Japan has now gone in the last year from the second largest economy of the world to the third largest. China passed them. China passed them. China today is growing very rapidly and gee, I've, I've heard people say, oh gee, if only we could be more like the Chinese. And you be careful what you wish for. I remember when people wished for being more like the Germans and then it was being more like the Japanese. You know, during the 80s, it was, in the 70s, it was, let's be more like the Germans. And in the 80s, it was, you know, if only we could be more like the Japanese. You know, now we're pretty sure we didn't want to be like them. Now, if we could just be more like the Chinese. Yeah, no, watch out what you're wishing for, because today they are younger than we are. By 2017, they will be older than us, and their workforce begins to decline. In 2017, by 2027, their population begins to decline. There are unprecedented things happening in the world. Almost everything that you know about how the world normally operates is probably incorrect. Mexico, you probably think of Mexico as a high fertility country that's exporting all sorts of young people. Actually, their unemployment rate's lower than ours. Their economic growth is faster than ours. And Mexico has seen one of the most remarkable transitions from high fertility in three decades. Fertility rate of six children per woman, per woman on average to about 2.3 now. 
and by the end of this decade, Mexico's fertility rate will be lower than ours. And Mexico will embark on about a two or three decade long period uh, that, that because they will have fewer children and, and because they will have relatively few old people but a peak number of people in, in their working age, that they will embark on a period that's known as the demographic dividend that when you go through this fertility reduction, you go through a period of about two or three decades where you enjoy very rapid economic growth. The same thing's happening in Brazil and, and China's coming to the end of it uh, uh, in South Africa. Much of the world is changing and changing in dramatic, unprecedented ways. Fertility rates are falling all over all over the world, and that has an implication for, for the labor force. Okay, so we have entered this new normal. What does that probably mean? And, and you know, the state economists and I use the term probably because we don't know exactly. You know, this is all new. The, uh, the folks at PIMCO talk about this purely from the standpoint of bonds. State economists and I have tried to expand this to, to you know, the public and private sectors well beyond, well beyond the bond market to try to understand how all this begins to affect the policies of how we do things. One of the things that it probably means is slower economic growth. It doesn't have to mean slower economic growth. The potential for increasing productivity is enormous, enormous. After Pearl Harbor, before Pearl Harbor, we were sort of limping along, trying to recover from, yeah, about like now. Okay, it was one of these kind of recoveries from deep depression, recession, where it was going to be slow and laborious, and it was going to take us years, and it was going to be hard. And then Pearl Harbor, and three months later, we were fully recovered from all that stuff, and we were at full stride, and we were looking at skyrocketing productivity and anything that got in the way of productivity increases was bulldozed. Basically, it was shoved out of the way. Just like in the, you know, the, the, in the combat uh, movies, you know, with the airplane that, you know, the, on the aircraft carrier, the airplane that didn't get started just right and wasn't ready to go, into the water, out of the way. Got to make room. We have to do this thing. We were on a productivity drive. We were seeing productivities in the double digit range per year. It was enormous. The potential for productivity increases is far beyond anything that we can possibly imagine. But the problem is, is that you have to really get to the point where you know that you have to have a real direction of where you want to go. So economic growth is probably going to slow down Labor and talent will become the scarce resource. And we use the term labor, actually, I ought to cut that out. It should be just talent. Here's the issue. The economy that ends up with the most talent at the end of the day wins. The whole thing is all about talent. And there's two, two ways you get talent. One is you develop your own to the maximum extent of, of your ability. Educate your children, retrain your workforce, build that talent pool to the maximum extent of your ability. And then the second way you get it is by borrowing or getting it from every place else in the world. Having talented people move here and making sure that this is a receptive place for talented people from all over the world to move here. And that's why we have scientists and engineers moving here from diverse countries of the world, like India and South Africa and Mexico and Brazil and Vietnam and China and Korea and places like that. We have people moving here from all over the world to little old Minnesota. And they're moving here because there are opportunities, but they have, those opportunities are open to them because they are talented people. And some of our biggest corporations stay here because we can attract and retain 
the most talented people in the world. And if those biggest corporations can't find the most talented people in the world and get them to move here, they will go to where those people are. You understand what I'm saying? Houston saw one of the largest construction companies of the world, Houston, Texas, saw one of the largest construction companies of the world move out over a weekend to Dubai. The, 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 their building block was filled with people on Friday and by Monday it was closed down and the people were in, in another country. This stuff can happen and it can happen real fast. And it happens in large part based upon what happens to that flow of talent and how we react to talented people moving here who look different, sound different, maybe wear different clothes, eat different food. How do we react to these people? How do we welcome them to our midst? What kinds of services do we provide? How safe of an environment is there? What kind of wonderful place is this for their children to be educated? What kind of cultural opportunities are there for them to enjoy? Outdoor activities, what, you know, what are the, the selling points for Minnesota? And that becomes the critical issue. There will be a single-minded focus on productivity. Now, that, uh, that doesn't just mean the, public, uh, the private sector. It also means the public sector. And the public sector is starting to see drives to productivity that for some people are uncomfortable. It will get much more uncomfortable. There will be drives to productivity that we will continue into the future. There will likely be chronic cuts in government, uh, government services and, and chronic government debt. Well, I don't really see much of a possibility beyond this unless we make some real dramatic changes in how we do things. There will be worries about how to pay for past promises. And here is the big one. Here's the big one for every state government in the United States, not just Minnesota, every state government in the United States. We have made a promise to folks over the last three generations or so that if you're old and frail and there's nobody else there to take care of you, don't worry, government will. It's called medical assistance or Medicaid. And it's not about young people. It's almost exclusively about long-term care. Nursing homes, basically, is what we're talking about. And the problem is, is that the cost of that are rising at 8.5% to 9% a year. Revenues are rising at about 4% a year. Medical assistance plus K-12 education plus debt service, which is like 2% of the total, account for three-quarters of the total state government budget. Three-quarters. You can cut out everything else. You can open up the prisons, shut down all the parks, get rid of higher education, get rid of local government aid, shut down everything else, and you may not still balance the budget in a couple years. Okay. We're, we're working on that now. We're cut, 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 okay, until there's nothing left. Okay. So we have to figure out a different way of doing things. We're on an unsustainable path here. So worries about how to pay for past promises, that's the biggie. That is the problem that Europe faces. That's the problem that Greece faces right now. Greece has a problem. Their workforce is declining, and they're not pushing up per worker productivity. Now, I heard an economist talking about Greece, and, and he said, you have to understand that we Greeks work really, really, really hard. Work long hours and sweat hard and, you know, I mean, this is all hard work and I don't doubt it. That's not what it's about. It's not about hard work. It's not about working longer hours. It's not about working more days. It's not about working nights and weekends and holidays. It's not about multitasking and working frantically. Actually, those don't actually improve productivity. They actually reduce productivity. Multitasking actually lowers your productivity. 
you make more mistakes. Increasing productivity is about working smarter, doing things better. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just, in just a minute. But that's what productivity is about. And so Greece has a problem. They're not pushing up productivity. Their labor force is declining. Their economy is literally getting smaller. It's expecting to, to drop about 5 to 6 percent this, this year. That's about three times as fast as we did during the recession. This is really dramatic. Their unemployment rate skyrocketing. And they're beginning to look at things like cutting pensions. You know that pension that we promised you? Eh, we'll only be able to pay half of that. And you know that Social Security nap? Sorry, not anymore. And that medical help? And medical assistance? No, can't do that. Can't afford it. Germans won't let us. Okay. Greece has a problem. They made all sorts of promises that were predicated on the concept of more rapid economic growth but they didn't do what was necessary to ensure that that was going to happen. And there will be disruptive things that will happen. There will be big disruptive, there's going to be great pressure for, huge pressures for dramatic changes in our societies. I don't know what disruptive things are going to happen. Some of them will be events like tsunamis and <laughs> volcanoes and earthquakes and things like that. Those always happen. But there will be other kinds of disruptive things. Now, this is one of the disruptive things I think is going to happen this decade. And it might happen in Minnesota. Is I think this decade somebody's going to find a cure, not, not a delay, but a cure for Alzheimer's. And when that happens, we will have to change all of our calculations. Wouldn't that be a pleasant thing? It would be wonderful that we would have to change all of our calculations. People will still get old. They will still get frail. They will still get sick. They will still die. But they won't die from this terrible, terrible thing of Alzheimer's. I think it's going to happen this decade. But see, if you're running a nursing home or if you've got services for shut-ins or, or people with limited mobility or something or, or memory care kinds of things, if you're doing those kinds of things now, you need to begin to think already, not two or three, four or five years from now, today. You need to begin to think about how would we respond? You don't respond yet, but you need to start thinking in advance. How do you go about responding to a change like that? How would the world change? There will be other kinds of disruptive things. One of the ones I, in, you know, the police officers here in the, in the audience, might have be amused by this driverless automobiles you know automobiles that well if the automobile is speeding and the and the owner is in the back seat sleeping and the drive the car is driving itself and it's speeding who do you give a ticket to how do you deal with insurance how do you deal with accidents there's all sorts of laws and regulations and how we react to things that would have to change. Is the technology there? Oh, absolutely. You know, that's, that's not, the, the technology is not the issue. It's the human societies, the human organizations that become the limiting factor. And there's going to be a whole, this is not, what I'm talking about here is not bad news. Please don't walk away from here discouraged or depressed or anything like that. This is all wonderful opportunities. Bloomington has opportunities that perhaps it never had before. Things that, gee, I don't know how we're going to do this thing. And all of a sudden, the opportunities can open up. Now, I've mentioned a lot about productivity. Let me just, let me just say just a little bit about what that means because I'm sure that you think that that just means bigger, faster, cheaper machines that produce things cheaper and, and put people out of work. Uh, that's, it, yeah, it does mean that to, to at least, you know, there is always that in there. But it also means some other things. One of the things that it means is making things better, improving the quality. What would happen if we could reduce the recidivism rate in our prison system? 
so that when people come out, they are totally reformed, ready to live in the world, and ready to be productive, and rather than going right back through the system and, and at great, great public expense. Suddenly you have a person that used to be an expense is now an asset to society. Wow. That would be wonderful. What about uh, children who come out of high school being fully prepared for higher education so they don't have to take remedial classes? Okay. We are seeing a rapid rise in the number of young people that come out of our high schools in Minnesota who require remedial work before they can ever get into college. And it costs them a year or two of their life. Now, we only have, what, 30, 40 years of work time. Take a couple of those years out for remedial work. It's a total waste. Something that you should have gotten in eighth or ninth grade, you have to go back and, and do it again. And that's a loss of productivity. And if children come out of high school prepared for higher education, we just increase productivity by a whole year's worth by 3%. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. There's a variety of other things that you can do to increase quality, both public and private sector. I mean, there's all sorts of things. But also, innovation, making better things. It's not only making things better, it's also making better things. And, and innovation we can have, you know, that's the, that's the cure for chronic disease. One of the things that we're real close to is the cure for diabetes. Diabetes is an epidemic in this country. It's exploding in numbers. And we're on the verge of a cure. Wow. That's enormous. That is big news. That is a big time kind of, kind of change. Okay. So we will see all sorts of changes like that. Now, how does government respond to this? You were told in the campaigns a year ago that there were two possibilities. We either raise taxes or we cut cost, cut out programs. And, you know, it may require both of those to resolve the kinds of issues that we're facing. We may still have to do those things. And I, I'm, my guess is we probably will have to do some increasing, some, some way to increase revenue, some way to cut expenditures. But the third way is to do things better in government. And that's one of the reasons why the legislature, in a bipartisan, a rare bipartisan move, this is actually bipartisan, would you believe it? A rare bipartisan move is there is something called the Redesign Caucus that is trying to figure out how to redesign, how do we do things in government to increase productivity in government. Now, the way we do things right now is that the, is that the, state, that the federal government micromanages the state government, tells the state government what they, want, what they want us to do, exactly how they want us to do it, how to dot every I and cross every T. And then the state government turns around and tells the counties and the cities and the school districts exactly how you're going to do everything. And we send people out to stand over your shoulder to make sure you do those things. And Lord help you if you don't because you have to cross every dot, uh, every T and dot every I exactly the way state guard. And so we do this with schools and, and the superintendent say, oh, you're micromanaging me. And then the superintendent turns right around and micromanages the principals and the principals micromanage the teachers and the teachers micromanage the pupils. We've got a micromanagement society. Has anybody here ever had to suffer under a micromanager? It's a productivity killer. It kills your incentive. It can kills your desire. It is very expensive to do. That person has to stand over you and watch you all the time because they know you're going to screw things up. So they can't be doing something. And the best way to improve productivity? Quit doing it. 
tell people what you want them to do, give them outcome measures, give them the resources to do it, and let them do it, and get out of their way. That's difficult. You have to actually trust people to do things, don't you? Okay. But it's possible. Realigning the incentives can make a huge difference, and all that can have a huge impact on, on what we're doing. We are undergoing some dramatic changes in our society, and these changes will be felt this decade. Uh, about a decade ago, the state economist and I pointed out to using this graph, actually, uh, or an earlier version of it, that's, this is very little change, just updated, using an earlier version of it, pointed out to a bipartisan group of legislative leaders that by the end of the aughts, we're in around 2010, beginning of the teens, this was more than a decade ago we were saying this, that based on this graph, we believed that we would begin to cut K-12 to pay for medical assistance and other health care related to an aging population. And we were told at that time that this would never, ever, ever, ever happen in Minnesota. And the response was totally bipartisan. It was about the only bipartisan response that I can remember from that year. In 2010, we cut K-12 to pay for long-term care. In 2011, we cut it again. By 2020, we will have as many people over age 65 as we have kids in K-12 education. This is not a short-run change. This is a long-run change, and health care is about to really start skyrocketing we are about to see more and more disabilities, particularly right at the first hearing and vision uh, um, and ambulatory disabilities. And basically, we have the potential for a physical trap. Now, this is a chart that the state economist and I pointed to, uh, uh, showed to, uh, to a group of former leaders, governors, speakers of the House, majority leaders, and other such people back in, uh, back in, fall of 2008 uh, and it's the same thing and it's still just as true now as it was back then that we face a physical trap okay. and the issue is not a short run problem it is a long run issue underlying short run solutions will not solve the problem Kicking the can down the road doesn't do anything. This is a long-run change. We've known this was coming. When did we know that people born in 1946 were going to turn to say, okay. And that trend growth alone will not be enough to solve this issue. Revenue growth is going to be met with increasing resistance. The only surprise that we had in the past decade you know, we've been saying revenue would be met with increasing resistance for some time. The only surprise we have is that things like the, the you know, anti-tax movements, et cetera, have been so weak and so late. That's, that was our only surprise. This was not, this was not a surprise that would happen. And efforts to, immediate, to increase it will be met with increasing resistance, while at the same time spending pressures are going to be driven largely by issues of aging and health and and spending pressures will be, will be very strong. Okay. We know how to solve this issue. Now, I fall back on a quote from a famous Canadian philosopher uh, who also played a little bit of hockey. And he was one time asked, well, Wayne, how is it that you can score so many goals? And his answer was, I skate to where the puck will be, not to where it has been. He said, well, that's obvious. Except, you know, in his mind's eye, he knows where the puck's going to be. That's really remarkable, isn't it? He can close his eyes and know where the puck's going to be in the future. And here's what's interesting. We know where the puck's going to be in 10 years. We've known for a long time where the puck was going to be. Most people age about one year every 12 months. It's very predictable. 
we've got a pretty darn good idea where the puck's going to be in 10 years. And so that leaves just one other thing. All we have to do is skate to that point, put our stick on the puck, and score the goal. And if we do that, Minnesota will continue to be one of the strongest, most successful economies of the world. And we will do very well, and we will prosper. That's all we have to do is begin to act on the knowledge that we have and how we are changing as a society. Thank you. Let me stop there and I think we have 10 minutes or so for questions. Yes, ma'am. I have that one. Um, you said that um, it's going to take people a long time, if ever, to overcome the depression. They have got the mentality, and I was raised by parents who were married at the time of the depression, and um, I've become a saver, like, you know, and repair yeah. things rather than mm -hmm. buying new. So then on page six, you talk about um, the increase to uh, increase the economy. We have to. Um, increase the labor force and get more inspiring people to make things. Who's going to buy the things that they're making? Okay, who's going to buy? Well, uh, the question is who's going to buy the things that we are making? And this has been a concern for economists all along is, you know, are we going to buy too much? Are we going to buy too little? You know, is there going to be too much demand for things? There are so many things that people can do. Uh, and, and new products keep coming along. Uh, you know, there was, uh, what, the, the, the president of IBM back in, what, 1955 or something like that said that in his opinion, there was a world market for about three computers. Okay. I think he missed the boat. Okay. Uh, Apple just released yesterday that that they had grossly undershot the, uh, the potential demand for their new uh, iPhone. If you make good products, people are going to buy them. And we seem to have a way of doing things uh, to make new products. Uh, and some of these can really help with productivity. Some of these products can really help with productivity. Uh, but we can also do other things. Economic activity also includes things like, uh, you know, it certainly includes making huge mounds of garbage. But it also includes cleaning up huge mounds of garbage. That's economic activity. Uh, and, and increasingly, I think, we'll see people involved with cleaning up the messes that we have made collectively over the last few decades. Uh, oh, there's plenty to do. And, and, and people are willing to buy products and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing people in the world today who, who you know, 20 or 30 years ago weren't sure where their next meal were, was coming from, uh, now looking at things like going out to eat. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, you, grew up, you know, in the kind of situation I grew up in, but, you know, about three times a year, we went to, uh, we went to sort of a local, uh, local place uh, for the Blue Plate Special. Okay. I, nobody here knows what the Blue Plate Special means. A few of us do. A few of us do. And we actually knew the proprietor, Sonny Look, and, uh, and, you know, and Sonny would come over and talk to us and everything. Uh, but this was not something, going out to eat, that was not something you did very often. I mean, it was a, it was a special thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, now that's something, you know, people sort of do all the time. Uh, somehow we've found a way to make services and commodities for people to consume that we didn't use to. And so there always seems to be a way. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of new products that, you know, two months ago I didn't know that I needed a cell phone. Now I don't know how I could live without it. I, two months ago, I was one of the Luddites, yes, I know. And my colleague, the state economist, still does not have a cell phone. He refuses to carry one. And uh, so if I, need, if I want to contact him, I have to go through his wife. 
and through her cell phone. <laughs> and uh, yeah, she's real happy about that. Uh, and, uh, but I have her in my contacts list. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, the world changes and we do find ways of, uh, you know, and, and there's all sorts of, you know, imagine there's all sorts of diseases and things like that that we can do, that we can take care of, and, and that increases economic activity. And, uh, um, you know, so I, I just think that, you know, that there are tremendous things that can happen in the world. Now, this wasn't actually consuming something, but it was, you know, flow of money and things like that. We'll point out somebody, somebody you pointed out that it was a Rotary Club, I think you last filmed me or something. Uh, Rotary International, and I'm not selling for Rotary, and I'm not a member of Rotary, but they've been on a campaign to eradicate polio in the world, and they may have done it. Eradicate it. Wow. I remember when I was a child, I had friends who got polio, who died from it. Uh, you know, I mean, we were scared to death. Uh, polio was a terrible thing. And, and it wasn't those little sugar cubes that we got when the first sock vaccine. It was the needle, you know. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that wasn't a product that my parents knew about in the 20s. So, you know, that was a new product. I mean, we find ways of doing things. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. I mean, I know you've been talking about this now for a while. And when you, uh, where is your sense of hope around this? Uh, because when I look at what's happening on the political scene, I don't see much political will to address these issues. Yeah. It seems like the, the discussion is very... Uh, Mm -hmm. Very surface, yeah. and it's all, it's all politics. So, what are the politicians okay. doing, and is that a source yeah. of hope, or where do you find a source of hope? Yeah. And my hope is growing, and not just hope. My expectations growing. Okay. I'm, I'm actually much more optimistic than I was two or three years ago. And here's the bizarre nature of this optimism, and it is very strange. For three decades, I would say to people, "This is going to happen in the long run." And their response was, yes, but we have more immediate short-run issues to resolve. We have to put that off. Okay. Put it off, put it off. You know. And that kept going on up. And, uh, and so last year, the state economist and I wrote a report entitled, The Long Run Has Become Short Run. We thought we would get the point across. That. Uh, we have been kicking the can down the road. And this is not just a Minnesota phenomenon. This is a phenomenon everywhere. Difficult decisions and decisions that might have painful results. And, and I have to tell you, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. There will be, if you're going to make real substantial changes in the society and get us back on track, it's not going to happen without some disruption. There will be broken eggs. It'll happen. My optimism comes from a couple sources. One is that I know, it, you know, I know on the news and et cetera, it doesn't appear this way, but from my perspective, from sort of standing outside on the edge of, of decision makers, the legislature and governors for a long time, there's a lot of really good folks. I have, n I have really never met a, a state politician that I would consider you know, a really awful individual. They, they all want the best. I mean, that's the reason why they're, I mean, it's not a fun thing to do. Being a legislator is not a fun job. Being a governor, I don't think is a fun job. It's very hard. Uh, and, and I don't think they're there to be obstructive. <laughs> I think they're there to do what they think is absolutely the very best. So I think there's a lot of good spirit. We just need to find a way of focusing that and maybe getting some agreement on that good spirit. My hope comes from the fact that I think we've kicked the can into a cul-de-sac. We have no other choices. And so the only choice we have today is to do the right thing or to do nothing at all. Those are our only choices.
And so I think that we can begin to begin to talk about some of these things. Now, there are some things we don't have to solve tomorrow. I mean, I, we don't really have to solve the Social Security thing tomorrow. That's okay. Medicare, a little bit more urgent, but we don't have to solve it tomorrow. Uh, there are some things we really have to deal with, and that's the workforce. That is, this is immediate. We need to start thinking very seriously about how, because, you know, it's not, you know, it's both, you know, the issue is both growing the size of the pie and how we divide it. You know, you got one group that says the only issue is the size of the pie, and the other group that says the only issue is how we divide it. No, it's really both. Growing the size of the pie and how we divide it becomes critical issues. And, and you know, once we get to that point of understanding that and find that we're really sort of semi on the same page, we just have to be willing to, to sort of turn in the same direction and move together. We'll be, you know, we'll be fine. Uh, and I'm beginning to see more and more interest in doing exactly that. That's this, this redesign caucus, is a bipartisan caucus, it's getting a rapidly increasing support because people are beginning to see that the, that the approaches that they've been taking are getting nowhere. And suddenly this offers a third alternative that we can all agree on. We can all find agreement on this third alternative, which is to do things better. And there the potential is enormous. Potential is enormous. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts specifically about this, but um, what if you could summarize three of the opportunities, one of your slides ended with all the opportunities, what would you say would be, from your take, the three opportunities, biggest opportunities facing Bloomington? Oh, biggest opportunities facing Bloomington. Okay, one opportunity I think is that this outward expansion is stopped right now that may be a transitory stop or it may be permanent. I'm beginning to think it's permanent. There are two things happening here. One is, is that as people mature, as they, as they grow up, they mature, isn't that a nice way of saying getting old? Uh, that as people age, uh, they want something different in house. Now, if, you've, if you're living on the Prairie Mansion, you may not have much choice. But for people that have choices, uh, uh, you may want something that's a bit smaller, more convenient, you know, nice, say, you know, say, well, what are the main things that you're looking for? Safe neighborhoods, clean, friendly, accessible, easy to get to, uh, uh, convenient, easy to maintain, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the marketing for a senior population is very different than the marketing for the younger families with kids. Okay. So there's a growing potential market there. I think that Bloomington is very well placed for that. Uh, I mean, you're right here on the <laughs> you know, interstates, you know? Wow, how much more convenient can you get? And yet it's got sort of a nice, nice uh, feel to the community. And it's a very nice, clean community. Uh, young people, and here I'm thinking about the Generation Y, the millennial generation, the 20-somethings today, apparently, and we still have to wait till they grow up a little bit more to finally to, to begin to firm some of these things up, but survey after survey is indicating that they have a radically different view of where they want to live. They're apparently no longer interested in moving further and further out to ever more distant suburbs and driving ever longer distances to get to work and spending more and more of their precious time instead of playing games on their iPhone, uh, driving, okay, and, may and mowing. Yeah, they don't want to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. So what are they looking for? They're actually looking for housing that is closer in, more urban, where you have friends and neighbors, people that get along, people that know each other, less maintenance, more convenience, cleanliness, safety, those always come to the top in everybody's list. Wow, guess what? Bloomington's a pretty good place. 
I think there's a lot of opportunities for uh, for Bloomington. I, you know, that in a world that is rapidly changing, and you know, very rapidly changing, and Bloomington is not in a bad position. I don't think in that kind of dramatically changing world. There are certainly challenges, but but I think those are at least a couple of the opportunities that come to the top of my head. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I just wonder what your opinion is of alternative forms of energy and why they stumble across it. Alternative forms of energy. I, uh, energy prices are forecasted to go up. There are good economic reasons why they'll go up. Uh, one is that the humans tend to take the easy to get to stuff first. And then they go to the more and more difficult. To, we've done that with oil. And, and so we've expanded outward in terms of getting oil. So when we got, I mean, there's a lot of oil. You know, the, the world known reserves of oil keeps expanding. You know, people say, well, we're about ready to run out of oil. No, we're not. But the, the, the cost of getting to that oil is getting more and more expensive. There are huge potential oil fields off the coast of Brazil that are in, what, a gazillion feet of water. I mean, you know, we think that Gulf well was hard to get to. These are like twice as far down. Very expensive to get that oil out. It's there. It's just going to be expensive to get out. That's going to raise the cost, the price of oil, the expense of oil, the, the oil that is being fracked out of the ground in Canada and places like that is a gunkier oil, requires more refinery, increased cost. Okay, so you got the increased cost there. Alternative sources of energy tend to be higher cost sources of energy. And, uh, you know, wind, solar, things like that. Although there are some technological changes that are affecting that. One of the most remarkable, I just read about, this was just, it was just in The Economist magazine just, just last week, uh, was, you know, a group of people were trying to figure out how could you get a solar array to increase the efficiency, you know, the mirrors turn and, and they've, in the way that's normally been done is sort of a, you know, semicircle, uh, sort of an audience kind of theater kind of setting. And, and, you know, so they started looking at some alternative forms and, and, and ran all sorts of com computer simulations. And what they came up with was, well, uh, basically the structure of the heart of a sunflower. Have you ever seen the inside of a sunflower and how the seeds are arranged? If you arrange solar mirrors like that, you increase the, the, the productivity by about 10%. Wow. <laughs> Just simply by listening to what sunflowers do. Uh, so, I mean, you know, there's the potential there of increasing productivity, but, but costs are still going to rise. That's going to affect what we do, how we do it, what we consume, how we consume it, things like that. That's going to be one of those other factors that's going to tend to, tend to make living further and further out more costly and living closer in more economical as those cost differentials rise. And, and we are, you know, economists talk about rent differentials and, and rent gradients. Basically, the, the cost of land gradient is suddenly going through a massive shift so that actually some of those further out areas have greater implicit cost and some of the places that have higher direct cost have a much lower implicit cost built into them and that's going to favor places like Bloomington. Uh, public transportation will also affect that to some degree. Uh, there will be a variety of things that will, that will affect that. But yes, these kinds of technological changes and resource pricing changes uh, will affect. The other thing that's affecting resource prices right now, particularly energy, is, is development of some of the poorer countries in the world. Places like China, Brazil, Mexico, places like that are seeing very rapid rises in incomes. And guess what? People there want the same kind of things that you want in your life. They'd like to have a car. Uh, they don't mind going out to eat every once in a while. Uh, they'd like to have a bigger house and, and more heat. I actually have heat. You know, 
It, I mean, there's a lot of places in China that have no heat at all, and climate's not much different than ours. Um, you know, it's, I mean, you know, I've talked to some professors that had to wear parkas while they were lecturing, <laughs> you know, because there was no heat in the building at all. I mean, everybody, <laughs> you know, it was like 10 degrees or something, and you know, because there was no heat in the building at all. There was no provision for heat. Gee, that might change. And if that changes, that increases the demand, which affects the price of oil here, you see. And so all that's going to tend to increase also. We're going to find new and better ways of doing things, um, uh, not just keep doing things the way we have always been doing. The world is changing, and it's changing at a blistering pace. And, and certainly there is huge impact of this change on the demography, on the demographic nature of the world. And the demographic nature of the world is also feeding back into this demand for resources and, and how we're changing in other ways. Is that nickel version of? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. This is fascinating. Thank you.